Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York and the independent marketers of Richfield gasolines, motor oils, and other petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape to the Nevada desert in the story of a foreign spy who sought to renounce the left arm and become once again an American citizen. As Hildegard Thielhead tells it in her exciting new novel, The Rim of Terror, starring Miss Nancy Kelly. I don't know why I gave him a lift, even now, with the terror gone like a half-remembered nightmare. I can't be sure why I stopped the big Bentley convertible on that lonely road in Nevada and gave him a lift. Maybe because he looked so bedraggled standing there, hatless in the rain by the side of the road. Maybe because he smiled grimly, almost with a sneer that was a challenge. I don't know. Anyway, I slammed on the brakes and he walked slowly up to the car. Torko, my big Chinook, stiffened on the seat beside me. Quiet, Torko. So you've decided I don't look like too much of a risk? Not at all. Please get in. You, you look very wet. As a matter of fact, I am very wet. Backseat, Torko. Torko, is it? <laughs> How are you, Torko? Well, he's quite a dog. I bet he could easily kill a man. Oh, he's really quite well behaved, and he wouldn't attack without orders. You have made yourself quite clear. Impressive machine, this. Mm -hmm, I love it, but I'm really not used to it yet. I, I just got it last week. You drive it very well. Oh, thank you, but I, I don't really. Where are we now? I'd say about 25 miles east of Winnemucca. You're new to this part of the country? Yes and no. I've never seen that view before. Mm, it's breathtaking. Such, such a difference from back home. Back home? New England. This is the first time I've ever been in the West, and I love it. The scenery is yes, so... Yes, but this particular scenery doesn't appeal to me very much. Why not? I'd say there's someone waiting for us down there. Look. I looked. And far below on the valley floor was a fork in the road and an abandoned building. Near it was a black speck that looked like a wagon and two smaller black specks that moved. Men, no doubt, though from here they looked like ants. I'd suggest slowing down. Not much, though. I expect they're watching us through field glasses. Who? Let me out here. What? This cut hides us from them. Stop the car. I'm sorry our ride together must end so soon. Don't be afraid. Have your dog sit in the front seat and keep him there until you are safe in Winnemucca. I... I don't understand. You know what a roadblock is? A roadblock? Are, are the police after you? Not the police of this country. Just tell them you have not seen me and they'll pass you on all right. Goodbye. Thank you. He turned and started climbing the steep bank at the side of the road. He stopped halfway to the top and impatiently motioned me to go on. I slipped the car into gear, and suddenly I felt very much alone and, and scared. I motioned Torkel into the front seat and started down the pass into the desert valley. A couple of miles further, at the forks, the road was blocked by a black delivery truck. I was almost tempted to swing around it, but the man in the plastic raincoat who held his hand up so casually didn't look dangerous at all, so I came to a stop. Another man in a black raincoat was leaning against the truck trying to clean the mud from his shoes. Across the panel of the truck was a sign that read Nevada Public Opinion Surveys, Carson City. I felt a little silly for feeling scared a moment before. Howdy, miss. We're making a traffic check. Yes? Mind answering a few questions? Only take a minute. What do you want to know? Well, now, let's see. Where are you from? Vermont. Vermont. Well, I declare, we don't get many tourists from Vermont. 
Uh, you come all this way alone? Well, I don't suppose you'd count my dog as a passenger. Uh, I guess not. Although I always say a dog's a man's or a woman's best friend. Nobody else with you? No. Have you given any rides to hitchhikers? No. no Through the windshield, I saw a man in the black raincoat reach into the van. There was a smear of yellow paint on his raincoat, and the letters on the neat sign were blurred. It had been freshly painted, and the paint had rubbed off when he leaned against the sign a moment ago. Even if you've given somebody just a short ride, we have to put it down. It's for the statistical average. I'm, I'm sorry, but I've lost too much time already. I, I can't answer any more of your questions. The man in the, in the black raincoat was beside the car now, peering in over the interviewer's shoulder. Somebody's been sitting in the seat next to Curly Head there. You can see where the seat's wet. Let's quit stalling, Mr. Smith. Shut up. Ma'am, you can see for yourself you've had somebody sitting in that seat not very long ago. My, my dog. Your dog's are dry as a bone, ma'am. I'll search the trunk compartment. Maybe she's got her got him hit in there. You get her keys, will you? You take your hands off the steering wheel. Now, nah, ma'am, just give me the keys. Talk over. I had no idea the Bentley had such power. It leapt forward under the accelerator as I swung it around, clipping the front bumper of the delivery truck, skidding across the wet road and throwing a, a sheet of liquid mud over the two men. Through the rearview mirror, I could see them running up the road after me, then stop and give up. I shifted into fourth and headed back up the mountain at 80 miles an hour. And then, as I rounded a curve, there he was again, my passenger, laboriously clambering down the bank at the side of the road. He waved to me when he heard the car, and... Again, I don't know why I stopped. Maybe it was the painful way he was limping. Maybe because his figure looked so tiny and alone in all that vastness. Maybe it was because I remembered the cruel blue eyes of the red-haired interviewer glowering balefully behind his thick glasses. Anyway, again, I stopped. Backseat, Torkel. Get in. I'm driving back to the main highway. I can take you into town that way. I would not have hailed you, only I twisted my ankle up there. Oh? Oh, I'm sorry. I was watching from the hill. What happened down there? Lose your nerve? Oh, I'm, I'm afraid I did. After they saw the damp mark your suit had made and the man reached for the ignition keys, I guess I lost my nerve. Where was the third man? There wasn't one. He must have been hiding. Was one of them red-headed with glasses? Yes, yes. The, the other one called him Mr. Smith. What's this all about? Who are they? Who are you? I suppose I do owe you some kind of an explanation. Uh, my driver's license and army discharge say I am Peter Whittlesley of Elko, Nevada. But they're very excellent forgeries. Forgeries? Oh, yes. You see, I am, or, or rather, was a spy. What? Yes, I landed in San Francisco three days ago in the crew of a little Greek freighter. Uh, Mr. Smith met me. His assignment was to get me from my ship to my new job. Where? Los Alamos, New Mexico? Naturally. I ducked him last night. Why are you stopping? Get out. How far can I walk on this please, foot? Please, please, just get out. When you picked me up, I was on my way to the police to give myself up. It's my only way to get away from them. You must believe it me. It sounds like a bad movie. Now get out. What about that bullet hole? What bullet hole? In the windshield. Oh? Well, I, I, I didn't see it before. I. My friend, Mr. Smith, of course. I suppose I didn't hear the gun go off over the sound of the motor. Do you believe me now? Maybe I do. When you have been sent on a mission into a country by the left arm... You're not supposed to change your mind and go over to the other side. They don't like it. The left arm? What's that, a, a fifth column? Well, I suppose you could call it that. How do you speak English so well if you're a foreigner sent over here by the, by the left arm? Foreigner? I was born right here in Nevada. And this is the only way I could get back home. No, please, don't make me get out. Take me to the nearest police station, will you? Please. I suppose it was my New England conscience, or maybe just plain old curiosity, or maybe... Well, he was attractive. And on the twisting downgrade into Winnemucca, I learned his story, how he'd been born in Nevada of Central European immigrant parents, how he'd been taken back to their homeland when he was 11, how he'd fought the Germans with the partisans, and after the war had been educated as an undercover agent by the left arm. 
how he'd passed every test and resisted every temptation his teachers offered in his one desire to return home to America. And believe me, America is home. I was born here and I want to work here and to die here. Do you, do you think the police will believe you? I don't know. Do you? I, well, I, I want to, but it's a pretty wild yarn. It's true. Every word of it. I know it is. I, I feel it is. Thank you. And now, tell me a little bit about you, a poor little rich girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, don't let this beautiful car fool you. It's the only extravagance I've ever indulged in in my life. Well, I must say, when you decide to be extravagant, you don't do it by halves. <laughs> oh, there's the city hall. Police station must be there. You can drop me here on the corner. You won't waste any time getting through town then. <laughs> I don't even know your name to thank you. Oh, it's uh, Elizabeth Whitehill. I shall never forget it, nor your face. <laughs> you're, uh, you're forgetting your cold. Huh? Oh, <laughs> thank you. My name is, is really Alex Peck. I hope I shall see you again someday. Uh, until then, wish me luck. <laughs> I, I do, Alex. Goodbye, and thank you. He turned and was gone, limping across the courthouse square, and I suddenly felt very much alone. I headed west once more for Highway 45 and, and the straight road across Idaho and Oregon for Seattle. And then a few miles further, Torkel nudged my arm. No, no, Torkel, no, we don't play when I'm driving, no. I glanced at him and slowed down. He had a wallet in his mouth. Alex's wallet. It must have been dropped out of his coat as he left the car. He'd, he'd need it. It was part of the proof of his story. I, I swung the big Bentley into a side road, whipped it into reverse, and straightened out on the road back to Winnemucca. I let the car out. Eighty. Ninety. A hundred. And a hundred and five on one straight stretch. And then, then down to a cautious fifty-five as I entered the town limits until I pulled up before the police station in the basement of the courthouse. Stay, Torkel. Ma'am? Are you the officer in charge here? I'm Sergeant Helding. I I'm looking for Mr. Alexander Peck. I drove him here not more than a half hour ago. Mr. Peck left his papers in my car. I, I thought he might want them, so I brought them back. Well, he's, uh, uh gone, ma'am. Gone? Yep. Ma'am, you don't know how lucky you were. That fellow was a lunatic. Lunatic? Sure. His name is Peter Whittlesey from Elko. Nuttier than a fruitcake. He escaped from the Carson City Asylum last night. They came for him in the wagon. A black panel truck. That's right. Had Carson City State Asylum painted on the panel. In, in, in fresh, fresh paint? Pardon, ma'am? You've made a dreadful mistake. That's the same truck that stopped me back at Indian Forks. It must be. You're one of the most stupid, incompetent ignoramuses that, that ever sent a man to be tortured. Yes, and perhaps murdered. Now, ma'am, them's mighty hard words. And I mean every one of them. Now, ma'am, let's not have any sass out of you. You're too nice a gal to go around picking up strangers. Just uh, run along now, ma'am. We're pretty busy but here. But don't you understand? Understand you're wasting our time. Good day, ma'am. No. Just a minute. What? That's your car over there, that yellow thunderbolt. Y yes Do you have any idea how fast you were going when you passed the airport? Why, I, I, uh... Well, I'll tell you. I was doing 90 on my motorcycle, and you walked right away from me. I got a good mind to throw the book at you. <laughs> Here's a free offer you won't want to miss. A free offer by your Richfield gasoline dealer. Just for the asking, you can get a new 32-page baseball book that's a hit in any league. This new Richfield baseball book is the most interesting book of its kind ever published. It contains all the major league schedules and many minor league schedules. It shows the World Series box scores. And it has a special baseball quiz you can try on your friends. In the free Richfield baseball book, You'll also find seating diagrams of leading stadiums and dozens of other interesting facts on America's number one sport. But the supply is limited. 
So be sure to get your free copy tomorrow from your Richfield gasoline dealer. Stop where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Ask for your free copy of the new Richfield baseball book tomorrow. And now we return you to Escape, starring Miss Nancy Kelly. He was tall and capable looking, the state trooper. He had a kind face, even if he was threatening to throw the book at me. I told him the whole story, every bit of it, and, and he believed me. And you will, you will help me, won't you? That van can't go much faster than 50, 55 miles an hour, and my motorcycle can do close to 100. We didn't run into the van coming into town from the north, so I guess it's traveling along the highway south to Reno, maybe to California. I can catch it and stop it, sure, so what? How do I know the guy isn't a lunatic, and the van isn't on the level? I got to have an identification. You'd, you'd like me to drive behind you? If you can identify those guys as the same guys who stopped you and tried to shoot you, I got a case. I'll make them wish they were never born. Let's go. Once outside the city limits, the motorcycle leapt forward. I held the Bentley at 60 until it was a half mile ahead of me, and then I accelerated to keep the distance constant. The tachometer crept up 4,500, 5,000, 6,000 revolutions per minute. The cars we passed were silent blurs, respectfully pulling to one side at the peremptory scream of the motorcycle siren. Then down the shimmering surface of the road, miles ahead of us appeared a lurching black speck. It was the van. The trooper waved his arm for me to slow down and swung alongside the truck. It was like watching a jerky movie from a great distance. And suddenly, the motorcycle swerved away and the, the trooper was firing his gun. And the van lurched into the ditch. The motorcycle slithered across the road, threw the officer onto the pavement. And the man in the black raincoat stepped down from the van and walked toward the fallen trooper, stopped and, and fired his gun. And then, and then the trooper raised his arm and fired. The man in the black coat fell forward and he caught his balance and then slumped to the ground like a puppet with a, with a broken string. I, I slipped into gear and, and drove up to the truck. The man in the black raincoat was lying on his back, staring sightlessly at the sky, a little red hole in his forehead. The trooper was sprawled out on the shoulder of the road, a trickle of blood from his chest soaking into the sand. Another man was slumped against the wheel of the van. They were all dead. And neither of the two men from the truck was Mr. Smith. Neither had pinkish red hair. Mr. Smith wasn't there. Mr. Smith still lived to avenge and pursue. But somebody else in this silent scene of death was alive. Somebody inside the truck, scratching at the, at the bolted door. I, I unlocked the black doors of the van. And there he was. There, strapped in a straitjacket, was Alex. <laughs> It was not until I'd untied him and had him safely out of the truck that I became faint. It is all over, this part at least. There's no reason to shiver and shake. I, I, I can't stop. Well, it's shock. Now, let us pick up the pieces. How did you get I, here? I, I found your wallet. Go on, make yourself talk. You you dropped it in my car. I, I, I thought you'd need it at the police station. Are you well enough to drive that machine of yours? I... I think so. Where? Well, that depends on what happened to Mr. Smith. Wh where is he? I, I thought he was in the truck. No. Have you seen him? And since he stopped the car this morning at Indian Forks? Where, where do you think he is? I have not the slightest idea, but he's looking for us, you may be sure. We've got to get away from here. All right. All right. I'm, I'm ready. Come on. Now, wait a minute. What happened to you? He pointed to my jacket. It was splotched with a deep red stain. Blood. No, no, I don't think so. Oh, the cans of paint in the back of the truck when you untied me. You must have spilled one. Take it off. Why? Do you want people to ask questions? Here, get in. Start the motor. Give me that jacket. What are you going to do? Ditch it. Ah. Oh, there's a car coming. Let's go. Good. It's in a dip a couple of miles back. They did not see us. My mother knit that jacket for me. Good. Then you know where you can have it replaced. Where are you headed? We'll drive straight through to Seattle. Oh, Seattle's too far. No, no, now listen. My friend in Seattle, Charles Matthews, he'll know what to do. He has, he has connections, even in Washington. He may not be too willing to help me. Under the circumstances, I could hardly blame him. Charles is bigger than that. I wonder. Two hours later, we were 120 miles nearer Seattle, and... Filling the gas tank at a lonely motor court set in a clump of scraggly pines. Sure is a thirsty bus. Took 22 gallons. Yes, it was nearly empty. That'll be 528. 
Will you cash a traveler's check? Oh, sure. All right, just a minute. Alec. What? My, my traveler's checks, they were pinned inside my jacket. The jacket you threw away. We'll have to go back. Oh, do you have any idea what that piece of road will be like now? Half the population of Winnemucca driving out to see where the gun battle occurred? But, Alec, that's all the money I have in the world. No, you can't stop payment on them. You can get your money back. But now, right now, I've, I've only got a dollar and 75 cents. Uh, let me see what I have in my pocket. Uh, two silver dollars, a lot of chicken feed. To yes, we can make it. With half a dollar to spare. Here you are, madam. Thank you. Come again. But how are we going to get to Seattle on 50 cents? At the moment, I have not got the slightest idea. Well, this tank full of gasoline won't take us half the way. Uh, you, you could phone your boyfriend, collect, and tell him we are strapped and ask him to wire you some money. I couldn't ask Charles for money. Why not? <laughs> we, you wouldn't understand. Uh, if you don't want to ask him for money, don't. Uh, I'll figure something out. Yeah, like robbing a bank. Maybe. Oh, with your training, that shouldn't be too difficult. Perhaps. I'm sorry. That was unkind of me. Why do you suppose we're bickering like this? I haven't the slightest idea. Haven't you? No. Neither have I. Payette, Idaho was the first big town. It was dark when we got there. Alec told me to pull up in front of the hotel. You can get a room and a hot bath while you're putting in your call to Charles. I can't get a room for 50 cents. Oh, look across the street. That's what I've been looking for. What? A pawn shop. <laughs> My watch should be good for a few dollars. It's Swiss, international currency. You know, Swiss watches. Now beat it. Get a bath. I'll take Torkel with me and call you in your room in half an hour. Come on, Torkel. <laughs> The hotel clerk showed me to a room on the second floor. It wasn't a very quiet room. On the corner beneath my window, the people of Payette were celebrating Old Timer's Day. They'd set up a kangaroo court and were trying their fellow townsmen who'd failed to cooperate by refusing to raise beards and wear pioneer clothes. But I couldn't waste time watching the fun. I had to get through to Charles. I, I placed the call and started the bathwater running when there was a knock on the door. Who is it? Here your towels, ma'am. As I unbolted the door, I happened to glance into the bathroom. There on the rack above the tub, fluffy and white, were my towels. I tried to push the door shut, but, but it was too late. Mr. Smith shouldered into the room. I, I started to shout for help, but the sound never came. He hit me in the pit of the stomach with his fist, and I, I fell across the bed gasping for breath as the phone started to ring. I... I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound. I lay there with the wind knocked out of me watching Mr. Smith as he picked up the receiver. Hello? How much delay? Well, just a minute, I'll ask my wife. She says to cancel the call. We'll try later. Thank you. Now, young lady, no monkey business. You try to yell, and I'll cut off your wind for good. You too, you and Peck, have caused me a good deal of trouble. I had a lot of trouble finding you. You should not have done that. How... How did you find us? The left arm never fails. Where's Peck? I, I, I don't know. You are lying. But I have plenty of time. I'll wait for him here. He is sure to return for you. I now had you to get to me, Alex. I had to warn him. I the bathroom door was open. Smith was holding my arm, but for a moment he relaxed his grip. I swung away from him and threw myself into the bathroom, pulling the door shut and locking it. I expected him to shoot through the door, and I ran to the window, ready to jump, but it wasn't necessary. There was a rickety fire escape. I crawled through and ran down the shaky steel stairs, dropped six feet to the mud, and ran around the corner of the building toward the old-timers' kangaroo court on the corner, and, and there was Smith coming toward me through the crowd. He, he reached out his hand for me. I, I whirled around and shouldered my way through the crowd to the table where the, where the man was sitting with the microphone. Please, please, please help me. Oh, hello there, miss. Now give me your microphone. Now, just a minute, miss. You can't interrupt please, this. Please, please. Please, it's a matter of life or death, Alec, Alec! Stay where you are, they found me! And then, and then Smith came for me. He and a, and a big man with a beard. And then, and then a, a tawny streak tore through the crowd. Torkel. He, he'd heard my voice. He ripped the big man's leg. He jumped for Smith's throat. But before he reached it, the man with the beard pulled out a revolver. <laughs> And Torka lay there, quiet. Mad dog, mad dog, I mad. tried to bend over him, but I knew it was no use. 
he, he was dead, and, and Smith had me now, holding me. I told her that dog was sick. Your dog? Yes. To see her, you think my wife cared more for the dog than she did for me. I told her a dozen times that dog was Let sick. Let me go. I'm not your wife. Now listen to me. Listen to me, please. You people, this man... He's a, he's a spy. He's a monster. He's trying to kill me. Listen to her. Go on, folks. Listen to her. Drunk. That's what she is. Drunk. Such a thing to say about your own husband. Well, I declare. Now, I'm going to take you on home to the ranch and put you to bed. You ought to be ashamed of Wait yourself. Wait a minute there. Now, now, just a minute. Now, maybe you don't know, but I'm the county veterinarian. You can't leave that dog dead in the street. Uh, according to the law, we've got to make an examination of any dog that's dead or alive and suspected of rabies. Now, you get that dog in the police wagon. But my wife... I don't care about your wife. She wasn't bit. Now, you say you own that dog. Your friend here was bit in the leg, and you were scratched in the arm. Now, you get that dog in the wagon, and you follow him. And you, too. Now, look here. Now, you look here. That's the law. Now, get. Or do you want a little help from the rest of these good citizens? Smith loosened this grip. I, I turned and edged through the crowd which was moving in on him and, and the bearded drunk. I, I got to the fringe, to the open street, and I ran toward the Bentley, and there, there coming towards me was Alex, coming from the pawn shop. Alex, alive, whole limping, but alive. Alex, Alex, oh, Alex, my dear. Get in the car, quick. Dorco, they killed Dorco. Get in, tell me about it later. <laughs> We've got to get out of here. Smith's... Smith said he was a mad dog. They're holding him. They said he'd have to have a rabies test because he was bit. Good. We'll <laughs> notify the FBI from the next town. And I got enough for the watch to buy gas to get us to Seattle. Did you reach Charles? No. No, Smith got into the room. He, he hit me. Well, you tell me about it later. Well, slow down. Here's the highway signs. San Francisco left. And there we are, Seattle. Turn right. I said turn right. You said... You said San Francisco left. Yes, but... We're not... We're not going to Seattle. What about Charles? <laughs> Who's Charles? <laughs> but I, I only got $20 for the watch. <laughs> I think I can get a little more for the car in San Francisco. Hey. Go to sleep, darling. You must be worn out. I... Don't know why I gave him a lift that day, but I'm awfully glad I did. From the magic of modern chemistry comes xylene, one of the highest octane gasoline components ever discovered. Xylene means new power for your car, new high Antinuck. And listen, today every gallon of Richfield gasoline contains xylene. Xylene and Richfield gasoline means surging power for the toughest hills and quick pickup in traffic. It means smooth, knockless power along the highway mile after mile. Moreover, your Richfield dealer offers you a choice of two great Richfield gasolines, both with xylene. For best results in the highest compression motors, select Richfield Ethyl. Ethyl at its best. For the average motor, get Richfield High Octane at regular price. Each Richfield brand is tops in its class. Each contains xylene. Try Richfield gasoline with xylene. Test it. Compare it with any gasoline. Stop where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robson and has tonight presented The Rim of Terror by Hildegard Tylet. Adapted for radio by Mr. Robson and starring Miss Nancy Kelly with Hans Conried as Alex. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week. You're being haunted through the war-torn ruins of Berlin by a phony music hall mind reader who has stumbled on a secret that can send you to the gallows and from whom there is no escape. The Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to be with us again same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Escape.